um, I guess it's, it's so silent that I'm feeling like, you know, we already started something. Um, I'm imagining myself looking at these pictures that in Australia and Sudan has got zebras, elephants running around. So I hope you are embedding yourself in, into this kind of landscape. We got a pleasure today. We have a pleasure having Juma with us, Juma Kigamba with us from Tanzania uh, and taking us on a journey to the great Serengeti National Park and the surroundings. Um, Juma will provide us an overview of what happens in conservation space. Very exciting, insightful story that he's going to share uh, that he has learned over the last few years of his work experience, as well as three years of PhD journey. He started here in 2021. Yeah. Was it in March? Juma? March, in March. Yeah. Yeah. And he's now about to complete. Of course, COVID held him back home, but it was a blessing because he could get a lot of work done while he was back home and he could bring all the results us to share with us all the stories from his work over the last nearly three years now. Um, and one of the main thing is that I would like to actually acknowledge, we got uh, Juma's colleagues from, from Maweka College in Tanzania who are also online. So thank you for your presence. I can't see you on screen, but I know you're behind the screen somewhere. And we would like to actually have a chat later on, uh, your questions or any, any insights into Juma's work. Um, and Juma is working as a lecturer at the Maweka College and as well as doing his PhD. So I will let Juma take us to the journey that we are all looking forward. Thank you, Kamal. Thanks, Juma. Yeah, now I have noted something before I start. Sorry, it seemed it doesn't work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Juma Kegamba, and I will take you to the beautiful Serengeti National Park, one of the beautiful places in Africa. And that is the place where you can enjoy the nature by seeing a lot of wild animals. And while enjoying that, you should not forget there are some communities there who are paying a huge price to make those animals survive. Now, my topic is conservation institutional framework in benefit sharing mechanism with the local communities. I have been supervised by Kama as the principal, Penny and Stephen Garnett. And my name is there, Juma Kegamba. I hope I said it correctly. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Today, of course, she got it right, Kegamba especially, <laughs> but she has been, you know, struggling. Yes, my outline, that's my presentation outline. Yeah, now you can see Tanzania where it is in the eastern part of Africa. And you can think how much it goes to the NT, almost the same size, but anyway. And I'm focusing on the northern part of Tanzania, that is the greater Serengeti ecosystem, 25 kilometers square, that the whole ecosystem. Now you can see Tanzania is having a number of protected area, I will explain later, but different, I mean, categories in terms of uh, the status and the way they are managed. And of course, receive a lot of tourists who visit many of the parks and they get a lot of money out of that, you may say 17% of the GDP comes from conservation, I mean, from tourists. And then we can imagine how much is that. And the leading one is Serengeti and Ngorongoro conservation area. That are the leading protected area together with, of course, Mount Kilimanjaro is somewhere here. And they are playing a greater role in terms of that revenues, which is correlated. Then going into those protected area, 
why we call it Greater Serengeti Ecosystem. It's a, you know, a network of protected area, you can see. It extends to neighbor country, southern part of Kenya, but my focus was only on those protected area that are in Tanzania, I didn't go to Kenya. And the deep green here, you can see this green here, that is the core protected area, the Serengeti one, was the first national park to be established in Tanzania. And of course it was established along with Ngorongoro, but Ngorongoro, you have the Maasai indigenous people who are living there. They were initially in Serengeti, they were evacuated from Serengeti, taken to Ngorongoro to give away, I mean, for establishment of Serengeti National Park. And then no any human settlement or human activities apart from tourism activities that's allowed in Serengeti. In Ngorongoro, no farming is allowed, but the indigenous people, Maasai people are allowed to live with their cattle. And then you have those yellow ones. These are the game reserves. There are four in that ecosystem and hunting by tourists is allowed in those protected area. Hunting is not permitted in Ngorongoro or in Serengeti. And then you have those blue and see two of them. Those are the that way we call them wealth management area. They are the community based, the community allowed to have them. They are owned by the community. Yeah, but the other ones are owned by the central government. Yeah, then you can see the way there. And then you have Loriondo game controlled area. Also you have some Maasai people living there, but they have divided currently this area now. And they are taking Maasai people who are living close to Serengeti here now outside. And, and that's the story of course, still hasn't completed because there are some allegations, there are some cases and dispute in the court going on. Yeah. And you find that out of those protected areas, Serengeti and Ngorongoro are UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And Serengeti of course has been named one of the Africa's leading, of course by World Travel Award, like, I mean, three weeks ago, it was again named this year, five times, I mean, five consecutive times from 2019. It has been awarded as one of the best. Now, you can see here the communities, the way they are settling in that ecosystem, that in the Western part of the Serengeti, they are the agro pastoral community. That's the community I was born and raised here, somewhere here. And then they are keeping small number of livestock, not compared to the Maasai people, but they are growing crops. All the way on the southern part, you will find those are agro pastures, but they have different you know, tribes. They are not all in one tribe, but they have one livelihood strategy. And then you have the Maasai people who are living inside, but also there are a small tribe called the Toga people. They're also close to Maasai in terms of a livelihood strategy because they both keep livestock. Mm -hmm. And you have the hunters here, the hunter and the gatherer. They only depend on hunting. The very small population of less than a hundred individuals that are living here on the southern part. And they are granted a permit to hunt free. And the, some of them, they're living out, but those one who are living inside are allowed to hunt, but they have allocated them in some specific area within Ngorongoro, not the whole park. Yeah. And then, now when you think of Greater Serengeti ecosystem, this area here, that red line indicate how many people, of course, are considered you know, in terms of benefit sharing, that not all of them, I will explain that, that this one here it shows that the conservation institutions are eligible only to provide benefit within 10 kilometers from the park. Not all these communities here, but they consider only people who are living within the 10 kilometers from the park boundary. And now, if we think of what's benefit sharing, 
yeah, a commitment to channel some kind of return, whether in monetary form or non-monetary form, back to those affected. Now you are having conservation activities, of course, affecting people, some were living there and then have been taken out. And then you needed to provide them with something. Yeah, and now the challenges, you have five conservation institutions operating in you know, different laws, different policies in the same area, but they have got their locations and you have got different objectives, but they all share one main objective of conserving the resources in the area. And they collect revenue from the same source of wildlife, meaning tourism, whether you are hunting or whatever, but it's just wildlife. And then you have got different cultures, you know, within the community, different culture and livelihood strategy. And the way they experience, you know, difficulties or the impact from wildlife is totally different because there are different communities in, the, in terms of their livelihood. Now, these, of course, are the organization you can see each one there having a different message. Like the Gorongoro with Masai Keto, they allow that. Though currently, they are taking them out from Gorongoro Conservation Area. The government are relocating them somewhere because they think their population is like threatening the conservation activities in that area. Now, what I did in my research activities, first of all, I began with a systematic review of benefit sharing. I've said that these conservation institutions, not only those ones which are located on the northern part in the greater Serengeti ecosystem, but these ones too provide benefit to the community. Now, I just wanted to know what kind of benefit are given to the community across the country, but also uh, those benefit accepted by the communities. Those were my two research questions in that first task. And then I found that there are three categories of benefit provided to the communities. First is the livelihood provisions. Now here, some conservation institutions provide food to the community, like in Gorongoro, because you have the Maasai there, they're not allowed to farm then you need to support them in terms of giving them grain. Yeah, they reduce the price of grain. They buy from somewhere the grains and then bring them to the community. The community will pay less amount of money to get those foods. But also they provide food, like nutritional foods to school kids at school, yeah, to support them. And then there are some conservation institutions, of course, which provide water for domestic use, for livestock, if that were, called we I mean I categorized that into livelihood because they support the household level or a way of living. Now there are many of them like uh, be keeping projects and so on. Those conservation of, of I mean the, the institution does that. And then another one was social service provisions. Now from those reviewed papers I found that social service provisions include things like building a school, okay, conservation institution will build a school for the community or a health center to the community or supply things like desk or you know tables or whatever things to the school or to the to the health center and then you have other things of course in the social service provisions and then employment like rangers okay now i found that there were two types of cause of employment like permanent employment mostly people who are working within the conservation institution, such as rangers, wildlife managers. And then you have the, those people who are employed like in the hotels, in the protected area. And then those were the three main categories. Now, the social service thing was regarded like communal thing because not all institutions, I mean, not all the communities would like to send their kids in those schools. They may opt to send their kids to other private school. And then the livelihood thing is like, you know, a household thing or an individual thing. And then that was published in this uh, last year, of course, in, in global ecology and conservation. Yeah. And now in the review, 
close to a half of the reviewed paper accepted the benefit. Of course, shows that the community accepted the benefit and again, half showed the negative views that they don't like what's being provided. And how in that review, I have indicated in that paper that livelihood was more accepted compared to the, I mean, to the social service benefit. And the forest-based benefit were more accepted by the communities. And the key factor were the community engagement, the level of engaging the community. Like when you have the forest, of course, in the history, you may find that most of the forest institutions didn't have a, like a, a more intensive protections compared to wildlife. Wildlife institutions, they're using, you know, military people and people are scared, you know, punishment, which is small, you know, greater compared to the forest one. And then you have a lot of impact, of course, by the communities from wildlife institutions compared to the forest one. And that's the key thing which I found. But anyway, the community involvement, like in those institutions which are highly conserved by the community themselves, they like the benefit from them compared to the government based. Yeah. Now, the other thing which I did, another task was now to go on the ground in the greater Serengeti ecosystem to find what the community say about those benefits. Now, I used three methods and then was key format interview, which I had like 18 people from conservations, basically who are dealing with the, with the community. And then I had focus group discussions with the community, 12 of them. And then I had the household survey. Then I went household by household for few villages that I selected. And then I got a lot of stories from the community for sure by in, you know, engaging them, seeing what they face from wildlife. And they were telling me a lot of stories, but one strange thing that I saw is that while I was there, of course, Lion got into one of the compound of, of this guy here, of this person here, of course, at night, and then he lost eight cow in a single night. And then I was in the same village called, called Robanda. In the morning, of course, I had the story, and then I went there. I found, of course, you know, very strange things like the way those are uh, kettles which were left, the injuries and whatever. Some photos, of course, I won't show you. I said I will show that. But anyway, he was telling me now how he will, you know, endure the difficulties of not having those ghetto, which he uses. And then what does is like the lion, these are the ghetto bomber. We call it ghetto bomber. The lion will jump in. Maybe others will be outside. We just find a weak place and then we jump in and this ghetto will just be threatened and they, they would break the bomber and go out. Of course, other, other lions outside will catch them easily. And later on, the hyena will join in. You know, they will be somewhere hanging because it's at night and then they would grab some. And that is the, the, the situation. Now, I got some stories also from the Hazabe people. These are the Hazabe people. They build their homes, of course, very temporarily. They may move, they may stay some months in one place and then they move, they go to another place depending on the availability of animals in the environment. And they may use some like natural features like gorges or even this the baobao tree with the, you know, they excavate and then they stay inside. Yeah. And what now I found like the local perspective student scholarship were highly rated. Now, there are not all institutions provide that kind of, a, of, a, of a, a benefit to the community, but some like Ngorongoro Conservation Area do provide scholarship for students within Tanzania. They are not sponsoring them abroad, but the major they start, they have to study in Tanzania in colleges and the university. And even from the WMA, but National Park doesn't provide that. Okay, and 
their scholarship is highly rated, like one of the most satisfying benefits to the community. Hazabe people value more hunting. This is the only tribe in Tanzania which is allowed to hunt. And they really value that. But it's only for those few families which I have said, only like 100 individuals, not all Hazaba, because most of, most of them now they are living another kind of life, like growing crops and so And the government is insisting them to change from that kind of life. And, but they really value that. And out of those respondents, 72% felt like benefit, of course, is securing their support, of course, is help, helping them a lot. And they are, uh, you know, incentivized by the benefit to support conservation objectives. And 22%, of course, they feel like, you know, even if they're not getting the benefit, they are, I mean, they can support conservation. You know, they can support it without conservation, I mean, without benefit. You know, they love the nature, they love the environment, the animals, they have been, having a close connection with the animals in terms of catch and so on. And then they don't think about that. But you can imagine eight or seven, eight percent will say, no, we need benefit. Otherwise we won't support conservation. Now that was published this year. Yeah, in I mean biodiversity and conservation. Now one of the story in that paper, we find that of course, you may see the red color here. There was a negative response from the community specifically toward environment. They, I mean, toward the employment, the way employment is given to the community. Like they don't like most of the people, they think that they were supposed to be given like specific uh, chance to be employed as the community, though the government post HE employment to the government website, whoever qualify for those criteria said will be employed. They don't even think about who is living close to the protected area. Now the communities, most of them, they are very angry with that and they don't like, they think that, you know, it's not fair because they have been highly impacted. And then you can see the hunt and gatherer, of course they are complaining a lot, because most of them, they don't qualify for those jobs. And then you won't find them being employed. And that's the, the thing. Now you will find that this community here, agropastoralist one, they are highly negative with the conservation because they, they claim that their land was grabbed by force by the conservation institutions and there was nothing they could do. And they live with a small land and that's the thing you can see they don't accept most of the things that are provided and you will see this group here specifically agropastoral three it's one village which is a highly you may say privileged because it's bordered by three protected area and you will find that they receive benefit from both protected area and therefore that's a, a good thing for them because they see everything to them is like conservation has got a value for them. And that is the acceptance level of the benefit in those uh, types of benefit that was found. Now, who pay for conservation? You may say the cost, of course, that the community incur, then the local people you will say are the ones who pay for conservation. Now, I had another task to find out how much the community lose, you know, to wildlife. Now, I assess the, 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 the impact and basically I use the data that exists within the government institution in Serengeti district here and in Gorongoro. Now, and they normally do this, like if an animal goes to the local community, distract crop, they will send one officer, a district game officer or any person from that office to go and assess the extent of damage and how much that person should be paid. Now, it's not like a, a real compensation, but they call it consolation, a small amount of money. 
okay, that if you lose like 10 acres, you only get like five acres. You won't be paid more than five, okay? And you, if uh, the value like it was maybe 20, uh, you know, 20 sacks of, uh, of 100 kg of maize, you will only be paid two. That's the thing. Now the estimate in that way, and it's very strange the way, of course I will show that, but you will find that in those data, more than a thousand incidents happened. I mean, in one year, an average of that per each year. And you will find that most of the incidences happen on those communities that are bordering the protected area here. You will find those are the area which are mostly affected. You will wonder these people here, why are not having that? There is an electric fence, a small one here, of course, is helping them a lot. But the thing is, sometimes elephants learn how to break that fence. It goes, of course, they go in the community. They have got a, a big brain of learning, you can imagine. And that's the thing. Now, accordingly, you may find that according to the, to the criteria of compensations, here I've shown in a red line that the compensations, when you farm like close to the protected area, 0.5 kilometer, you won't be compensated. Or if you do anything like, uh, you know, having livestock close to the protected area boundary, you won't be compensated. Half a kilometer. Then that person who is assessing is coming to measure the distance also matters. Okay. Yeah. He, he should report on that paper, which he feel that this person, of course, was at a steady distance from the boundary. Then you won't be you won't qualify for that. Yeah, and you will see those arrows shows the movement of the animal. Sometimes we call them corridors. You can see a corridor of elephant avoiding a huge population here, a densely populated place. Here there is a town called Mugumu. He has been to Mugumu. And you, they avoid that places. And then you can see they go this way and find a way. Now, sometimes, of course, they get to the community and don't find a way because of the settlements. Rangers will be called to come and take them back. And those are the things which happen. Now, you will find that, of course, most of the communities here are affected. Those ones who are living close to the protected area boundary. Now, these ones, in approximations per year, over 900 acres are distracted. Just one in one community, you can imagine. It's in one district. And there are other districts which are bordering this Serengeti ecosystem, 12 of them, you can imagine. That's, it's one district I only managed to assess for crops. Now, the, most of the damages normally happen during the crop maturity and harvesting time. Because in Serengeti, harvesting is July to August. And you will find that most of those incidences were around May or the way to July. Now you can imagine how that is significant to the community because they have invested a lot from the, you know, growing the crop. They have used a lot of effort to that stage. But in the livestock predations, there were no any, you may say there is no a good uh, maybe pattern in that, but you will find that mostly these months, at least there were low incidences, August to October. Now, annual losses of crop, I equated that into US dollar, close to half a million. And that's crop annually. And then you may think that one may be smaller, but just think of the uh, economic uh, power of those communities. You know, they live under huge poverty. 1,000 US dollar matters a lot to them. And then they lose that. But I have said this one is only one district, Serengeti district. And this one for livestock. Now, for livestock, of course, Serengeti and Ngorongoro, those the Maasai people who are living inside. And you will find that livestock, of course, they have got a lot of mechanisms, having fence. Sometimes they improve the fence. And mostly at night, you won't have any effect. I mean, uh, at, at night, you keep the livestock inside. But 
it, the farm will be left outside at night and then it's prone to be uh, attacked. Then you can think, can you think I get eight deaths per year on average? That's only a single, I mean, that's two. That's Serengeti district and Ngorongoro. Eight people die on average each year. And the compensation is less than 20% of the actual loss. You can think about that. Yeah, elephants are leading, but human lives, of course, is value. If you lose uh, your loved one, of course, these ones amount will be paid to the family. Okay, that's very little. Okay, they say it's consolation, it's not compensation because you cannot value you know, human being. And then they say, how much will you pay for a life of someone? Then they pay what they call something to help the, the family in the funeral or something like that. That's what they provide, very little. And then elephants are the most leading in terms of uh, those assessments which I found in the, the government document. They are uh, highly distract, distracting crop, but also they are very dangerous to people. They have been attacking people and they're more aggressive. Uh, those elephants which are found close to the communities, especially in the Western Serengeti where they, they go to the crops, they are more aggressive compared, uh, the way the community say, they're more aggressive compared to those ones who are staying inside. If you go to those ones like, uh, you know, both by tourists, viewed by tourists inside, you really find that mostly these ones are very aggressive close to the community because they're being threatened by the community, speared, hammered, you know, by stones or whatever. They learn how to uh, attack them. And then you will find most of the time those guys, you stay there watching, vigilant, you know, to scare away elephant. But they are somehow some of the NGO and other conservation organizations provided them some explosive material to scare the elephant away. But you needed to stay there the whole day long. And then it, maybe they make some shift, you know, at night they will be replaced by others. But you may think, I mean, in terms of labor, labor, how much they stay there. And then some people are forced to harvest earlier. You know, before the crops are fully dried, they just take them home. And then they continue again taking the crops outside, you know, drying and then taking them back in the, uh, in the house during the evening. And then the next morning they will do the same. It's a, a lot of effort, of course, they are using to, 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 to have that. Then hyena are the most dangerous, most killer to most of the livestock. Yes, we have lion, have wild dog, and other like jackals and whatever, and cheetah. But these ones, spotted hyena specifically, are the most notorious to livestock. Buffalo have been found to attack more people in Ngorongoro compared to other places because in Ngorongoro you have people inside and then it's easier for them sometimes during movement to you know come across the, the this animal and the last task which I did is the legislation of course that one of the compensation already submitted but the policies and legislation that I reviewed the government document to see how benefit and you know, human wildlife conflict are covered within the policies. Now, I found that little benefit, of course, if any, were located to the community. New policies, of course, have got more coverage of benefit sharing compared to the old policy because you know, the ideology of community engagement came recently compared to the previous documents which were focusing on conserving or protecting wildlife. They regarded human being as a threat to conservation. And you can imagine like this example here, that for example, an amount paid for, you know, trophy hunter to kill one elephant is 20 time, 22 times than the amount that will be paid to a family. You can imagine, okay? That's the uh, real thing that I found in the document. Okay, just for a single elephant, now imagine the life of someone, how much the family receive, okay, it's less 22 times than the value of that to be hunted by a tourist. 
And then there are a lot of document, of course, lack details of implementation. I found one policy, uh, I mean, uh, of human wealth conflict management, but will expire next year without being implemented. A very nice document. And then I was shocked to see that. Now, my conclusion, no a single benefit worked for community. Of course, you will find that because of differences in terms of catch and livelihood strategy, then each community prefer its own benefit. Then you may think that there are a lot of differences. Community pay a high cost for conservation, but receive very little to, I mean, in terms of benefit. Household benefit are valued more compared to communal benefit. Now I regard communal benefit as those ones like uh, the, 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 the social service benefit. Policies and incentives, of course, I think should be reviewed, replaced with the new improved benefit to the community. That's my conclusion, which I think, and that's the references. Some, of course, will be in my thesis. And Asante Sana. In Tanzania, we say Asante Sana. OK, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Juma. That's, to me, that's a very exciting journey you've been on for the last so many years. And thanks for sharing with us um, and providing those insights. Uh, it's always exciting. And we always learn something new, I think, while listening to you. Any questions for Juma? Thank you. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I was interested in your final conclusion there. To what extent is there political will and resources available to rewrite the policies and adjust the benefits for the communities? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Of course, in terms of our conservation, there is, you may say there's a good will. I mean, political will to conserve the natural resources. And the whole idea is just to accrue more benefit from conservation. Because, you know, most of the developing country, you, you have to think of how to get the revenue. And protection of natural resources is the most important thing. Now, engaging the community is a new thing. I understand it's hard in terms of politics. And then, we needed to voice that out and show the government and the, the policymakers that you know these as you know the community receive little benefit and you can actually see that yeah and they may be convinced to say yes in Kenya for example a nearby country they use the actual cost they pay the actual cost now the Tanzanian government of course have been involving some of the NGO to do the same, but not themselves. Okay, they avoid that because they say, you have got a, a lot of complaint from the community. You have got a, a lot of elephant within the country. How much will you spend in paying them? And that's how they reduce the, you know, the payment. Yeah, and then they avoid to engage in that kind of agenda of increasing the payment to the actual cost because of the large scale of the distractions that the same animals does to the community across the country. Yeah. Thank you. When you, which is the right it's way on. up. It's on, okay. When you were talking about the Boma um, and um, where the cattle are kept at night, the Bomas are made out of thorn, aren't they? Yeah. Yes, very, very sharp thorn. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I was um, going to ask you about, Juma, is um, what about the bees? I know some villages are looking at using bees to try and turn elephant around. Sure. There's a problem with that, of course. Bees don't fly at night, and that's when the tembo come. That's when the elephant mainly come. Yeah. Um, 
Are there any developments being used um, to try and turn elephant away from the communities, from the from from the um, the farms? You know, I know chili oil, for example, is one thing that's being used. Yeah, they have not only used those kind of strategies like bees. They have been using other methods like use of uh, chili, you know, hot chili. Yeah, they make them and they, they put on their rope and then they put along the farm. But elephant normally tend to land. Yeah, they may stay for some times, you know, and then they learn yeah. that this one can be, you know, not useful and then they will cross. And then it, most of the studies that I came across, it shows that most of those strategies, including locals, methods like using drums, they beat drums, you know, to scare the elephant away. They work for some times. Okay. They work for a short period and then the elephant will learn and, you know, find a mechanism. Okay. A fence, electric fence was put there. Yeah, it's just close to, you know, to, from 40 comma mm -hmm. heading to Mugumu and then you have about 40 kilometer of that fence. <laughs> but recently, the elephant have been, you know, seen, they are breaking that fence, yeah. pushing the, the poles down and then they cross. Mm -hmm. And there's and... a lot of things that are happening with every strategy that you think. Right, yeah, right, yeah. Right. They, they, the issue of uh, thorns that you said, yeah. where I mean, they use those, uh, I said the bombers, the keto bombers are made of thorns. Most of them, of course, to prevent uh, I mean, the, 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 the carnivores from getting in, yeah. but, you Demo. know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but for the elephant, it's yeah. not necessarily, you won't use that for the keto bombers because yeah. elephant doesn't attack yeah. the, 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 the livestock, yeah. Yeah. but if you use that along the fence, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the crops, again, it's not emphasized because you will harvest a lot of vegetation to make them, to make a fence, you know, okay. and that's not a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they use other methods, but Oh, they're very, very clever. Um, where we put containers in, yeah. um, what the villagers are reporting back to us now is that the elephant are going into the crops early, early in the piece to get, you know, before they have a chance to harvest the crops, okay. the elephant are going in there. Yeah. And so, they, yes, they're, they're learning. They're a, a, an amazing animal. Yeah. I've actually seen video of an elephant using his tusk yeah. To push down the electric fence because yeah. the electricity doesn't come up the yeah. tusk. Yeah, yeah. And then he steps yeah, over it. <laughs> it's a similar story that yeah. I was last year when I was in India. Yeah. So putting down a big, huge fence like this, yeah. just with one foot, putting yeah. it down. Yeah. And you can see. And the other one, the locals did was they used firecrackers. Yeah. So using firecrackers, they thought they could fight them. So by the time the locals finished with their firecrackers, the elephants knew they will line up on the other side that this is the sign for us now to go in. <laughs> they started like really very, very clever animal. That, like, like that, that was a kind of signal for them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're very clever. Yeah. Do you want to answer that one, Jimma? And Any questions online? Yeah, there's that one, of course. Most of eight people. The community. Yes, yeah. Now, uh, Professor yeah. Wahab, of course, Kimaro, you can see there, it's from yeah. Mueka. Yeah. The, the issue of how do we avoid from more attack? It's really hard because we are advocating conservations, meaning that we are protecting those animals, of course. They are, you know, we have limited the number of poaching mm -hmm. and elephant now they are somehow, you know, roaming around and we will need to find the mechanisms to defend, you know, our people from being attacked. And it has been seen, of course, in most of the places, not only in Greater Serengeti, but across the country, you will find those cases. We only have eight because it's just, you know, within those small area that I assessed. 
Now think of other places across the country where we have the same number of population. Serengeti, it's not even having large number of population of <coughs> elephant yeah. compared to other protected area. It's not even close to Selugem Reserve, which is 50,000 kilometers square. You can think about that. And even Tarangire National Park, they're having large number of population. Serengeti is famous for, with large population, there is Budapest. It doesn't harm anybody, doesn't distract crops. Okay, they are the, you know, close to three millions, but they don't cause any destruction to crops or to people. But elephant <laughs> is really an issue. Yes, thank you, Professor Hab, for that. Juma, can I ask you a question about the compensation? Um, having spent, Dan and I spent a fair bit of time in the Serengeti in the last 10 years or so, but yeah. we've, you know, been a bit astounded by the, enormous amounts of money that are being poured into the Serengeti by tourists, which is good. You know, it's good that they're putting that money in, but we've often wondered what actually is happening to that money. So I'm wondering, because until for our last visit, and our last visit a year ago, we actually saw some uh, development in the park, which was fantastic to actually yeah. improve tourism, like facilities and bathrooms and things. But before then, there was very little yeah. um, other than in the private lodges and things so we always used to think well it's great you know we can all afford to give you this money but what's how is it being managed so I wonder the money that's being paid for the compensation is that coming out of the funds collected from the park or well, where's that yeah. money coming from now that's not the money which is spent for compensation yeah okay it's collected of course you may say the ones who pay for those compensations is Tawa. Tawa is Tanzania Wallaf Authority. They're the ones who pay. Now, if you get to read my paper, Tawa is contributing very small amount of money to the community yeah. because it collects a lot of resources, like 25% from the WMAs go to Tawa. And then it collects from hunting activities, from game reserves. And Tawa is responsible okay. for dealing with those animals damages, you know, like in the national parks, like the animal goes outside the national park, the national park people are not responsible with that. That's what I have been saying in my paper that I yeah, think yeah. should be changed because yeah. the tower are the ones who are now really dealing with that animal, taking them back to the parks. And the national park people may assist, but they don't even pay any cost to that. Tower is responsible for that. And they use those money from hunting activities and so on to pay the people who are affected by the wildlife, I mean, across the country. And that's how it is. Now, the money that you are saying, how, of course, they collect a lot of money, those national parks, but, you know, small country still is struggling. Most of those resources goes now across the country, used for road constructions, you know, electricity, any other social service across the country. That's how it's being spent. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's understandable. Yeah. Yeah. Very hard. It's hard because you have poverty and trying to conserve wildlife together. Yeah. You know? It's so hard. Um, yeah, uh, Juma, that is a great presentation. I really like um, that. I mean, the photos with, you know, all the wildlife, that is good. So um, in your talk, you said they've got this 10 kilometers away from the protected area. Those communities get compensated. So I just want to know, with that, you know, boundary, is it is it out of objective, you know, analysis like to say okay this is 10 kilometer away or is just like is, is it like informed and you know i i mean back home when people outside that jurisdiction like you know the people who are not within you know the zone that should be compensated yeah. when they know there's benefit sharing then they tend to relocate okay so do you, do you see that happening? Or is it, that's do you see cases of that? So, so you see the population builds up and then it brings another, you know, social vices and stuff like that. Okay, now there's a, a good point there that you mentioned. It's like this. I've said two things there. 
First of all, the community that are eligible for benefit are within 10 kilometers from the park boundary. Okay, beyond 10 kilometers, they don't pay, like not compensation, no, benefit like giving them those aids like schools or whatever, they only base on 10 kilometers. But the issue of compensation, that's a different thing. Compensation, they don't pay only within half a kilometer from the protected area boundary. If you go in the farm close to the border of the park, you won't be compensated. Or if you put the kettle bomber along those places, you won't be compensated. But any destructions which is done, you know, beyond that park, you know, if you go even beyond 10 kilometers, you will be compensated. You are eligible for compensation. Do you understand? Mm. Yeah. yeah. If the animal goes even, you know, several kilometers from the park, you will be compensated. You will be in that list of being given something. Yeah. And the only issue is that compensation or consolation. Yeah, it's Personal. consolation. That, that's what we call, it's not compensation, it's consolation. Now, consolation have got a different definition, not hugging someone, but, you know, giving them something. So I guess, I guess, all that seems to be on the common side, but not for Right? That's, that's yeah, yeah, it's sure. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's a buffer zone, and they, you know, it's like to limit people from doing an activity along those borders. Yeah. Any questions online? What do you think uh, will be a <laughs> permanent solution? <laughs> it's uh, that's. That should be worked out with the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's uh, maybe. Thank you, Mayengo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we needed to think about that. We needed to <laughs> next year. We needed to work out to find the solution. We need to research. Yeah, that's a a good way forward. We need to think about it. Thank you so much for the question. Okay, this yes. well, last one. So. We saw 50-50, right? The beneficiary, 50%. Yeah. Just hold on so people can hear you. Okay. Oh, just, just, um, just a quick one. So um, with the beneficiary, we got like 50%, you know, respondents saying, yeah, you know, and about 50% are negative about it, right? So maybe they are not getting one. So maybe in your presentation you said, but do you think that with the conservation institutions, is something that they are working at to to diversify the um, the benefit so that it will attract more people to like the benefit. And so, so to attract more people from the negative, those who now they feel negative about the yeah. benefit sharing, yeah. to to start to like the benefit sharing in terms of what they do, the project. Yeah, yeah. Now, my project, of course, was showing the conservation managers, what the community think about the benefit they provide to them. Okay, yes, giving the conservation managers the view of the community, how they think about what they are being given. But it opened a way that conservation management or the authorities, you know, we have to investigate what the community want to understand what they think should be done. Like the have given, of course, the opinion of the community in those paper on what should be done to limit the number of animals getting to their community. They think that the community should be helped in terms of a unit, because they form their own units there to prevent those animals. But the organization of those units is very poor. The management of the protected area, they are not even connected to them. They are not helping them, but they should Mm -hmm. push forward to assist them in terms of even giving them knowledge on how to defend themselves from the elephant and so on. Those are the things that are, I presented in this paper. Now, it was very hard, of course, to, you know, research of three years, and then you explain everything. It's very hard to select what I can present to you guys. It's really hard, but you read my papers. Of course, there's a lot of things that I have discussed. Yeah, thank you so much. One question online, Julie. Okay. The last one, a welcome post piece of work. What is your opinion on the consolation mechanism? Okay. Now, 
that's a good question, Fidel. Yeah, my opinion, the way I think, first of all, is outdated. The consolation mechanisms, the way we have that law, you can imagine the rates which are indicated. You know, you may think like a person, a family get, you know, 400 US dollar, 400 by losing someone. You just think about that. It's very small, you know, it doesn't even help them to send that school, I mean, the school, I mean, those kids to school who were depending on the father or, you know, they have lost someone who is, you know, and then that's very strange. Of course, I have a lot of stories that I can explain to that, but consolation should be improved to the communities. At least we have to think about it. If you can sell a single elephant, you know, for 15,000, and then you pay the community person lost his life, and then you pay the family for that small amount of money. Uh, you know, it doesn't make sense. You need to think at least improve that consolation amount. Yeah, that's my suggestion. That thank you, Fidelity, for the question. And one of the foundational thing in here is, I think we all know it's the colonial conservation approaches that actually underline all the kind of this landscape that people are living in and that some stays when you're looking at that map, you know, now the communities are living outside. I was imagining those people are the ones who actually protected that area, lived in there sustainably for years and years. And suddenly we go, got those colonial governments who actually excluded them from that area, put them at the periphery. And now those are the people suffering for centuries, you know, uh, so equity, governance, their voice in decision making, it's, it's all needed to be worked out to, to get it right. And somebody has to revamp the system uh, if we want to really get, get it right. There have been some efforts now recently started by the IUCN. They're saying reimagine conservation. So that is thinking about people being part of conservation. And in that, in that way, if we think, we as human beings are also part of nature. So, and we try to exclude ourselves or keep ourselves superior than the other animals because we can't afford to live sustainably within nature. So we try to actually take privileged position for ourselves and let the other animals and species to actually live in that area. So when we want to visit and see an elephant or a zebra or, or a giraffe or something, we take that you know, special pass to get in there. And it's, it's just, when you look at from community's perspective, I believe reading that book, Narrating Nature, yeah. is, is, it's like, it's for Maasai people, beautiful book written by, I think, Mara Goldman, if you ever get a chance to read it. Um, and she describes that the, the way conservation is planned in, in Tanzania is, is like now, Juma was talking about, you know, expanding that. It's, it's for protecting wildlife, generating that money. Um, it's not for people. And that's where we need to change it because we need to think, how can we go together in this space? People as well as, you know, uh, all the other spaces thinking as one nature, one system. And I think that as many of your colleagues have asked Juma, yeah, yeah, what yeah. solution and the solution should be worked out together. There should be better partnerships there should be better understanding of communities, you know, what they want uh, in an ideal world so that there is equity. Uh, there shouldn't be anyone who is left without any compensation if they have paid for it uh, and the, the forefathers have paid for it. So it's a long way to go. And, and unfortunately, this is the situation in many countries, in Africa, in Asia, wherever we had colonial, uh, uh, rulers, the way the conservation, uh, these national parks being set up, excluded, you know, local communities in those areas. There are very few examples where we can have people living within national parks and wildlife centuries. We do, but the beauty about our indigenous protected areas is at least we got something different. It's very unique to the I think there are not that many examples of 
indigenous protected areas uh, around the globe. Yes, the same way we had our national parks. Yes, we have excluded people and we have dedicated those places. And even having their role in management, we are finding it hard you know, to accept that. And when you were thinking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, that Serengeti National Park is about 25,000 square kilometers. We th I was thinking about Kakadu National Park around 20,000 square kilometers, around the same size, mm. uh, where we are actually thinking that the co-management is working, but we all know where it is. Uh, so, but the better models could be developed. And, and the idea is that I think the benefits are for both, for the governments, as well as for people, as well as for conservation. And that's, that's one of the main things we need to all focus on that there are mutual benefits for all the parties if we could learn how to work together and understand who pays what kind of cost. So, okay. the final remark. Yeah. Any other questions from online? Any, questions? any comments? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. We also have um, a reception after. Ah, thanks. Yeah. Hi, Juma. Thank you very much for your presentation and a very good presentation as well regarding with conservation. A conservation is, is like sometimes it's really hard. Uh, and then there are a lot of hampering issues. For instance, like people who put fire everywhere, smoke, hunting, slashing and burning for agricultural activities. So would you mind elaborating a little bit how you're going to protect your area area conservation area from a wildfire or from slashing and burning system for agriculture uh, proposed. Okay. Now, if I got you correctly, now in the map that I was showing the Serengeti ecosystem, on the western part of the ecosystem where you have the agro pastoralist, they are used also to hunt the animals. Previously, they, that's their culture. They not only the, 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 the I mean the hunter and, and gatherer, not only the Hazabi people, but the Hazabi people are still practicing that as their main livelihood strategy. But on the western part, the agro pastoralist, they use it too. They eat bush meat and they normally poach the animals from the park. And it's a threat. And then he, some people, of course, claim some of the land for agriculture. They need to cultivate crops. But you won't find that in the eastern part where you have Ngorongoro. The Maasai people are using it only to, you know, grazing, uh, raising cattle. They are not even thinking about, you know, cultivations and so on. But you go outside, of course, they have learned how to do it. But they don't claim that from the protected area that to be given a land for cultivation. They claim a land to use that to raise their livestock. On the Western side, you have more pressure of the community wanting you know, to harvest the resources from inside the park, but also claiming a land to continue growing crops and so on. Those kind of things we normally have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's the government just to limit them, you know, to limit those kind of pressures, but you have human population growing, expanding, and those kind of issues. Yeah. Do you see um, this political pressure because there's yeah. a massive population of yeah. uh, Sure. Uh, Juman, do you see, because of the massive population bomb that Tanzania is going through, now I grew up in Tanzania yeah. uh, as a young Kijana, um, and going back later in later years, I've just seen this huge population bomb. Do you think the pressure from this bomb, this population on Serengeti is going to be, in the end, a significant threat to Serengeti National Park, a political threat to Serengeti National Park? Yeah, yeah. Now, that's a very good thing. If you have seen those game reserves there around Serengeti National Park, okay, you have seen those game reserves, they are established purposely to protect Serengeti. Okay, it's like Serengeti is the core. Now, they are limiting number of threat, anthropogenic activities that at least if it's poaching will end in those game reserves 
won't affect more the core part, which is the Serengeti. Buffer. Yeah, it's like buffer zones. That's a good thing. You know, it's a buffer zone for, I mean, for Serengeti National Park. And we understand, of course, most of the politicians use that. That's what they have. Of course, most of politicians may, you know, use that as a, uh, as a point that, you know, you elect me, I will make sure those game reserves, you will get the land from there. Those kind of things normally happen okay. from the politicians. And we have those threats. Okay. But the government is firm, of course, it's dealing with them and then maintaining that those are protected area. But there are some, of course, lands which were taken by force. That's a true thing, that there are some other places which were taken by force by the government to protect animals, yeah. Oh. yeah. Thanks, Joma. Yeah. I think that's been amazing listening to you and we can carry on this conversation outside um, with that, what would you call? With the... Uh, Thank you for all the online participants. Thanks, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Ah, that's a good idea. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, it's all right, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. thank you, man. You will send me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. No worries, yeah, yeah, well done. Yeah.